Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload on this 22nd day of the month of August of 2019. Uh, as we go into the fall, because we got State Fair just opened up today, uh, we're not doing a State Fair episode, but once we get through the fair, then we're going to be getting closer into the political season for when people start paying attention to the Democrat nomination process for president because we got the presidential election coming up next year, but it always seems that the fall of the year before the election is when people start to pay attention. And undoubtedly, unless something catastrophic should happen, we know that President Trump will be renominated by the Republicans. That's almost a no-brainer. Uh, but on the Democrat side, it's a wide open field. Now, they've had about like 25 or 30 candidates. About three have now dropped out. Uh, Governor Hickenlooper and I think Governor Inslee uh, from Washington, Washington, Colorado governors, they've uh, abandoned their um, presidential races along with uh, one of the con congressmen from California. I can't remember his name right now. But nonetheless, we're still going to have the Democrats running around on every single debate, and another debate's coming up in about three weeks, three or four weeks from now. Um, and you know what they're going to do? They're going to talk about health care. Health care, health care, health care. And they're going to say health care is a right. You're going to hear that a lot. For the next 15 months, we're going to hear health care is a right. Just like we've been hearing it for about the last 10 to, 20, 10 to 15 years. So the first thing is, before we get into talking about health care being a right, we need to take a look at what is wrong with government-run health care, because that's what they want. And that's what our Prager University segment for today is going to start off with, with what's wrong with government-run health care. Let's figure out what's wrong with the way things are going, and then we'll take a look as to what the Democrats talk about and, and, and have something to balance about, and then we'll take a look at how we actually got to this discussion of how health care is a right. Because I don't believe health care is a right, honestly. Uh, but let's see what Prager University has to say, and then we'll go from there. It's very easy for a politician to stand up before voters and say, health care is a right and then passionately advocate for single payer or free health care or Medicare for all, whatever term they might use. But before we consider the merits of the government managing your health care, and that's what this all boils down to, maybe we should ask a more basic question. What do we mean by health care? Because if you get sick, and here we're talking major illness or you're in serious pain, you don't just want health care, you want quality health care. And where is your best chance of finding that? The answer is right here in America. For skilled doctors, cutting-edge medical treatments, and care without long delays, no other country rivals the United States. Not even close. Nobody from Texas is going to Canada for medical treatment. It's almost always the other way around. Sure, our healthcare system has lots of issues, and we should address them. But do we really want to upend all the advantages that we do have and start from scratch? because that's what would have to happen if we completely turn healthcare over to the government. So let's imagine we make the change. We hear a lot about how great free healthcare would be, but it's only fair we look at the downside. The first is that government-run healthcare takes medical decisions away from patients, that means you, and puts them in the hands of bureaucrats. They decide, for example, how many MRI machines are going to be available, or under what conditions you can get back surgery or a bypass, or even whether you qualify for cancer treatment. That's how it works in the United Kingdom, under its single-payer system. Because it has finite resources, the National Health Service, or NHS, sharply restricts access to treatments like hip and knee replacements, cataract surgery, and even prescription drugs to deal with common conditions like arthritis and diabetes. If you suffer from any of these ailments, and many others in the UK, you may just have to live with the pain. And let's hope you don't have a medical emergency. In a January 2018 article in the New York Times, patients in emergency rooms around London are described as having to wait 12 hours before they are tended to. Corridors are jammed with beds carrying the frail and elderly. To deal with the situation, hospitals were ordered to postpone non-urgent surgeries until the end of the month. That hardly seems like an improvement over what we have in the US. A second big problem with single-payer systems is that they are expensive, really expensive. 
A recent study by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University found that a Bernie Sanders-style Medicare for All health system would cost a tidy $32.6 trillion over 10 years. That's on top of what the federal government spends on health care today. And this is not a new number. Other studies have found the cost to be roughly in the same range. So how would we pay for it? Kenneth Thorpe, a professor at Emory University and health policy official in the Clinton administration, spells it out. If you are going to go in this direction, Medicare for all, the tax increases are going to be enormous. Not just for the rich, Thorpe estimates, but for working Americans and the poor too. Charles Blahaus, the author of the Mercatus study, puts it this way. Even a doubling of all projected individual and corporate income taxes would be insufficient to finance these added federal costs. And he considers that a conservative estimate. Canada knows all about exploding health care costs. In Ontario, the country's biggest province, those costs took up 46% of its entire budget in 2010. By 2030, that number is projected to be 80%. In other words, in a few years, Ontario will have little money to pay for anything except health care. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, government-run systems depress the search for new cures. Biomedical research spending in the U.S. far outpaces that of any country with nationalized health care, even when you account for differences in population or size of economies. That's one reason medical breakthroughs rarely come from countries where the government controls health care. They come from the United States, where the government doesn't. The lion's share of biomedical research and development spending in the U.S., over $70 billion in 2012, comes from the private sector. Discovering new medical cures and technology is a profitable business, and thank goodness it is. Those profits drive innovation. Take away the profits, and you will surely take away the innovation. Single payer, free health care, Medicare for all, they might sound great, but like all visions of utopia, they ultimately produce a lot more harm than good. I'm Lan He Chen, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. <coughs> Sorry about that. So uh, there is a, I think a pretty, that was a pretty good case on uh, the ins and outs of government-run health care without going into complicated details. But now let's contrast that with what uh, U.S. Senator and presidential candidate Bernie Sanders and others who are allied with him on the Democrats. And in this clip put up by Bernie Sanders, we are going to put a, a, uh, an, an ad out. I don't know if it's an ad, just a YouTube video or what. This came from Senator Bernie Sanders, from his YouTube channel. There's going to be, a, you're going to see a lot of familiar faces all talking about the same thing. Can, we can make health care a right. And listen to what they say, because some of these people who Bernie Sanders in 2017 put in this video are actually running against him for president for the nomination. So uh, let's take a look and see what Bernie Sanders and company have to say. We talk about morality. What we are talking about is all of God's children, the poor, the wretched. They have a right to go to a doctor when they are sick. In our day, certain economic proofs have become accepted as self-evident. Whether you're a mother battling cancer or a grandparent at a nursing home or a kid with a cough, you ought to have access to health care, period. Among these, the right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health. For those people who do not have access to health care, where is the justice? We are behind every country pretty nearly in Europe in this matter of medical care for our citizens. Wouldn't it be so much better if we had a simple, seamless system of Medicare for all? Health care ought to be a clear right, not an exorbitant luxury. You know, we are all one diagnosis away from a major illness, which is why Everyone having health care is so important. Our goal is to match the achievements of our medicine to the afflictions of our people. With Medicare for All as our goal, we will be able to ensure that Americans are having access to the health care that they need from the day they are born and for the rest of their lives. I believe it should be the goal of this country to provide health care for every single American. We can improve the quality of care while we're bringing down costs. I know how hard it will be 
to provide health care to every single American. The insurance companies, drug companies, they don't want to give up their profits. How can we build upon the successes of the Affordable Care Act, create a system that truly works for everyone? We still have nearly 30 million Americans without any kind of health care coverage. We should be dreaming big as we think about the future. Everyone deserves the chance to lead a life free of the economic insecurity caused by unforeseen medical emergencies. A hardworking single mom in New Mexico should be able to get the same health care as a millionaire or a billionaire. So I'll be fighting with Bernie, and I hope all of you will be too. So I ask you to work with us at the grassroots level. Speak to your neighbors, speak to your co-workers. Let us go forward and finally do what this country should have done a long time ago, and that is to guarantee health care to all people. Okay, so now that's what your current crop of Democrat presidential candidates are all saying. Now, mind you, yes, FDR mentioned it. So did Harry Truman, so did John F. Kennedy, so did Lyndon Johnson. They mentioned it, but they did not run full-fledged campaigns. Their presidential campaigns are all dealing with other problems, and then they would throw in one line about insuring everybody or having health, you know, everybody has the right, you know, should be able to go to a doctor. You know what? I don't know of anybody who gets denied going to a doctor. If you get into a car accident and you need to go to a doctor, you're going to go to an emergency room, and what happens? They're going to treat you regardless. You have that right. So that right to see a doctor is there. The question is, who's going to pay for it? And really, the Democrats are really being disingenuous in that regard, but I'm not going to spend the entire hour discussing it because we've, we've covered some of this before. But I want to go back to this whole, we can, we can make health care a right thing. Because even with FDR and LBJ and JFK and Harry Truman, they, they put that goal out there, but it was ne they never talked about a right. They just say, hey, we should, we can, we will. That's just like saying, I think everybody should have uh, car insurance. That doesn't mean car insurance is a right. I think everybody should be able to go and see a doctor and should be affordable. That's a good goal. That doesn't mean it's a right. So where did this whole talk about rights come from? Because the right to going to a doctor and the right to health care is not in our Constitution. It is not in the Declaration of Independence. It is not in the Federalist Papers. So where does this come from? You know, would you believe it or not, it's, more of a, it's a more recent innovation. I think it's about 52 years old. That's really where it comes from. So we're going to go back to what we covered last week. The show last week was about Woodstock. And the one thing that I wanted to play was the one thing we couldn't play because we ran out of time last week. So we're going to show you the last thing that we played last week on messed up things that happened at Woodstock. Pay attention to the, the last thing, especially if you watched the show last week and you kind of remember where we cut off. They actually go through a list of illnesses and injuries, medical scenarios that were reported at Woodstock. That is right there on that entire three and a half, four day music festival. This is what they had, they had for uh, medical issues, right at the end of this particular clip. It was three days of mud, drugs, traffic jams, and overflowing toilets. And yeah, a little peace, love, and legendary music. The 1969 Woodstock Festival remains one of the most iconic events in music history. Yet, as the decades pass, those who weren't there start to see it all through rose-colored glasses. But that doesn't mean that the festival was all dancing, holding hands, and daisy crowns. These are some of the messed up things that happened at Woodstock. Bathroom line. These days, a stadium might have one toilet for every 45 or 50 seats, but at Woodstock, there was one porta potty for every 833 people. According to ThoughtCo, the wait could take up to an hour, and the toilets were overflowing with raw sewage that was mingling with mud and running downhill into the crowd. Yuck. Let there be granola. According to the Smithsonian, established food vendors didn't want to work Woodstock, 
mostly because of its projected size. So organizers settled for three dudes called Food for Love, who had little vending experience. By mid-Saturday, they were running out of food, so they quadrupled their hot dog prices from 25 cents to a dollar. And then a bunch of peace-loving hippies burned down two of their concession stands because they were annoyed at the long lines and outrageous prices. Happily, the day was saved by a group called the Hog Farm Collective, who passed out thousands of cups of granola and saved everyone from total starvation. It wasn't supposed to be free. According to ThoughtCo, the festival was originally supposed to take place in Wallkill, New York, and cost $18 for all three days, or just seven bucks per day. But residents of Wallkill passed a law banning the concert, and organizers had to find another venue with just six weeks left on the clock. Then, a dairy farmer in Bethel offered up some land. The stage, parking lots, concession stands, and a children's playground got finished just in time. But organizers didn't think to prioritize ticketing. By the time 50,000 people had walked right in and camped out next to the stage, it was too late to go back. So Woodstock became a free festival, a mistake that would turn out to be financially devastating for its organizers. What a trip! The festival was famous for the mud and the music, but it might have been even more famous for the drugs. And people weren't just selling drugs, they were putting them in stuff that they handed out for free to unsuspecting festival goers. A nurse told the Times Herald record, Outside the tent, they were giving out electric Kool-Aid laced with whatever. A lot of the kids hurt with this stuff were just thirsty. They didn't have any choice. Woodstock organizer Michael Lang recalled being extra careful about everything he consumed at the festival because laced food and drink was everywhere. He said, I didn't drink anything that didn't come from a bottle I didn't wash or open myself. The Hippie Apocalypse. The scene on the roads leading to the festival was similar to the opening credits of The Walking Dead. Politico even calls Woodstock one of the top 10 worst traffic jams ever, with vehicles jammed up for 10 miles on the New York Thruway for the entire three days of the festival. Some people even abandoned their cars and walked in, turning the freeway into a parking lot. A few acts even had to be flown in via helicopter, and residents along the roads were trapped by the abandoned cars blocking their driveways. The Grateful Dead Many people said The Grateful Dead was one of the worst acts at the festival. Even Jerry Garcia's friend Phil Siginer told the Times-Herald record, it was the worst show of theirs I'd ever seen. But it wasn't exactly prime conditions for a concert. Dead drummer Mickey Hart told Goldmine, it was a very terrible moment for us. The stage was collapsing, it was raining, Jerry Garcia and Bob were getting shocked at the microphones. Peace and Violence Woodstock was mostly peaceful, although there was one notable instance of violence. According to the Huffington Post, during The Who's performance, political activist Abby Hoffman got on stage and took the mic. The Who's Pete Townsend tolerated him for a few seconds before hitting Hoffman on the head with his guitar. Put some shoes on, hippie. The on-site festival medical team dutifully handled what was expected to be a crowd of roughly 50,000 people and turned into 500,000. According to the Journal of Emergency Medical Services, by the end of the week, staff reported that they had treated 797 bad trips, 23 epileptic seizures, 57 cases of heat exposure, and 176 asthma attacks. There were also 938 foot lacerations, 135 foot punctures, and 346 random other foot injuries, proving that people really ought to wear shoes. CNN reported that a woman also fell from stage scaffolding and broke her back. Remarkably, considering the massive crowd, only two people died during the festivities, one from an overdose and one in a tractor accident, while half a million lived to tell the amazing story. Thanks for watching. Click the grunge icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So there you have it. Did you catch that? I'm gonna, I, I wrote some of these numbers down. I missed one. Uh, two deaths. 797 bad trips, and we're talking the acid trips here. Uh, I missed what 23 was. Uh, 57 cases of heat exhaustion, 167 cases of asthma, 938 foot lacerations with 135 foot punctures. And I think I missed one that was right after that that just scrolled by real uh, quick. Uh, that was your medical situation with uh, half, almost a half million people at Woodstock. The, it was a Journal of Emergency Medical something. So let me ask you this. If we take those injuries and apply them into the 21st century, why is government responsible 
for providing health care for 797 bad LSD trips. I mean, okay, 57 cases of heat exhaustion, I, I, I can see that. Uh, 167 cases of asthma, eh, that flares up. But 938 foot lacerations with 135 foot punctures? Maybe if you're going to an outdoor concert, you should wear shoes, and you can avoid that. There's a certain level of personal responsibility. Now, the fact that uh, I don't think that um, the tax... I don't think the taxpayers were on the hook for, uh, I may be wrong, I don't think the taxpayers were on the hook for any of the, uh, or many of the uh, Woodstock cases. I, I don't think so, but I, I, I will confess I don't know. But is it really government's responsibility for 797 bad LSD trips in 1969? Now, I actually believe it or not, there could be some culpability uh, because really, this came over from the CIA, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not joking about this, uh, and this is not a conspiracy theory. This is actually something that was uh, brought out in the church committee hearings back in the 1970s. Because, and what does LSD have to do with health care other than Woodstock? Well, that's actually my tie-in. Um, because there are things that happened in the 1960s which gave people the impression that health care is a right, and that's where the Democratic Party of today gets it from. So, let me explain. It starts with the first acid trip, which is actually in, in uh, Basel, Switzerland, from uh, Albert Hoffman, who is the person who synthesized LSD. So, let's take a look at the origin of LSD and the first trip. The long, strange trip of LSD is a fantastic journey into the deepest reaches of inner space. The trip begins in Basel, Switzerland in 1943, when chemist Albert Hoffman stumbles upon the formula for LSD at Sandot's labs while searching for a drug to stimulate the circulation of blood in the body. For the past eight years, Hoffman has been studying the properties of ergot, a fungus that grows on diseased kernels of rye. The fungus has a mysterious and varied reputation. In China and the Middle East, it is known for its medicinal qualities. In ancient Greece, it may have been an ingredient in the sacred drink used in ceremonies at Eleusis. But the fungus, ergot, is also the suspected cause of St. Anthony's fire a terrifying condition that afflicted people throughout Europe who consumed diseased rye. And the whole village would go crazy. They would, in essence, go off on an LSD trip. People would end up dancing wildly in the streets, uh, jumping out of uh, windows in their houses. Hoffman first synthesized LSD in 1938, but he had no idea of its potential. Now, on April 16, 1943, Feeling perhaps that he missed something during his initial tests, he mixes a new batch. And he apparently absorbed some of the drug through his skin that day because he began feeling lightheaded and sick, he thought. And so he went home, climbed into bed, and instead of getting flu-like symptoms, he had some rather extraordinary hallucinations. Intrigued by the experience, Hoffman decides to ingest the drug again the following Monday. He takes what he thinks is a small dose. This very small dose, the first dose of my experiments I planned, was very, very strong. He bicycled home, climbed into bed. His family was away at the time, and so he had a lot of fear that he had perhaps damaged his mind by doing this. He lay in bed. At one point, his consciousness was up on the ceiling, looking down on what he took to be his dead body. And the object, like his uh, chair, uh, had, was like he, if uh, he was a living object, it became moving from inside. He survived the night, and in the morning, rather than feeling hellish at all, he felt wonderful, he felt reborn. He went out into his garden, everything was sparkling with life. Although the drug doesn't work as a circulatory stimulant, 
Hoffman and his colleagues at Sandoz come to the conclusion that LSD may serve as an important tool for studying how the mind works. Little do they realize that they are unleashing upon the world a substance that will someday have a powerful effect on society. A substance Hoffman will come to call his problem child. And it was the CIA which really um, worked on experiments back in the 1950s, 1960s that really brought it into our culture. There was there were a series of experiments called MK Ultra. Now, if you were to actually do an MK Ultra search on the internet, you're going to find a lot of conspiracy theories. They're they're out there. There are some really wacko stuff that is not really part of the church committee investigation. It was really the church committee uh, from 1975 that really had uncovered what the CIA was doing. You've got to keep in mind in the 1950s there was a lot of paranoia amongst our intelligence agencies because we were just going into the Cold War. So we were facing off with the Russians and the Russians were expanding uh, the Soviets. The Soviets were trying to spread communism throughout the world. We were trying to fight it everywhere and so now here we have the search for the perfect truth serum and LSD was one of the substances that was being experimented on and in 1960 they used the VA hospital in Menlo Park California's one and, and Stanford University uh, those two uh, facilities as part of their LSD testing grounds L, uh, CIA sponsored research investigations and one of the people involved was a person named Ken Kesey. Kesey was a writer and if you've ever read the book or seen the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest it was based upon observations from Ken Kesey at the Menlo Park VA Hospital part of this MK Ultra LSD CIA funded experiment. So we're going to hear from Ken, K Ken Kesey right now uh, on the inspiration for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. The real spark for that book came when I'd been over to Pendleton Roundup with my dad. And on the way back on the bus, going down the Columbia Gorge toward Portland, there was a big scene up in front of us and they stopped uh, the bus and there were cop cars and ambulances and the bus driver got out and asked this, uh, I think it was a construction worker that was walking along and talking to people because they were in the process of building the dam, the first big dam on the Columbia, which wiped out Salilo Falls and which was where I had been watching ever since I was a kid, watching the Indians get out there on the rocks and scoop and stick those big salmon. And the guy says, oh, some drunk Indian got out in the road with a knife in his teeth and ran right straight into the grill of one of our trucks. And it's so perfect seeing this big line of people and over here, this construction job going on, building the dam, and the story that this Indian took on modern American machine head on with a knife in his mouth and, and from that I gradually expanded it into the cuckoo's nest idea. I had to uh, report for the draft up here uh, and I'd also put in an application for a, a scholarship to Stanford and I had dislocated my shoulder in wrestling not long before that so I let my arm hang there was a big gap there in the x-rays. And the guy had taken the x-rays, looked at stuff, and he says, you don't really want to go in the service to you. I said, no. My life just took a turn and headed down uh, to the Bay Area. And we were living with a bunch of other grad students in a little, little area there. And uh, Vic Lovell was part of the drug experiment and that was going on at the Menlo Park Hospital. And he got me to sit in for him. And finally, I became one of the regular guinea pigs. And they took me in to give me this, these drugs that was on the ward and put me in a nice little room that was locked 
little tiny window here with the chicken wire glass on it and gave me this stuff. And we did it for like eight weeks. I got 20 bucks every Tuesday. And I started looking out at those guys through this little chicken wire window and I saw that the doctors were unaware of something, that the nuts knew quite well. And that part of it was the fact that all this Freudian stuff is baloney. That these guys were in there not because of something that happened to them in their bathroom when they were six. They were there because something had happened to them in their adult life. The stuff that really made me see the hard side of it in uh, the cuckoo's nest fashion was a stuff called, uh, it was IT-290, and there was Ditran, but mescaline itself. Me mescaline, when you take mescaline, you begin to see Indian uh, blankets in your mind. You realize this is something to do with not only America today, but with America a thousand years ago. After I was finished with the experiments, I came back and got a job as an aide. I was put on that very same ward and worked nights there for uh, nine months. And in the course of the working, I was able to write that book, almost all on the ward. The nurses would come by and say, oh, Mr. Kesey, you're typing up your reports again. I'm so proud of you. And I, I, I didn't tell them that what I was doing was uh, not only writing about these guys in twisted uh, uh, consciousnesses, but I had joined the, the ranks of the twisted conscious. But, but then it was doing stuff that I had not to be doing. But I knew that I was seeing something really peculiarly American and tragic and glorious at the same time. And so that book really just kind of wrote itself. Okay, so we've heard one comment from the peanut gallery. This guy's nuts. Well, we're actually going to show you how nuts he is because we have a recording of one of the magic trips from that, um, that eight-week study that uh, Ken Kesey had participated in. And so you're going to hear the recordings from 1960 when he was actually taking LSD under a supervised controlled medical environment. So, did you have a good trip? I'll tell you this, there's no, I, I'm, I've never, never taken it. I, the, I don't ever want to go through that. That sounds really freaky to me. But see, here's the thing about his magic trip. Ken Kesey enjoyed it. To the point where, because it was actually legal, there was not, no, nothing prohibiting it at that time in the 19, early 1960s. It wasn't until like 1966. I think it might have even been later that it became a class one or schedule one felony, uh, you know, schedule one control substance and, and a felony. I think the state of California may have put it on the books in 66, but in 1963, 64, 65, it was legal. And so what Ken Kesey did was he decided to give it to his friends and they put it in Kool-Aid. And Tom Wolfe actually writes about it it's called, in, in a book called The uh, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. And Ken Keyes, he was going out on weekends, putting to, uh, you know, parties together with, with light shows and giving people LSD. And if you notice how peaceful and mellow things were at Woodstock and there was no violence or no anger, it's because most of what was used at Woodstock for drugs was marijuana and LSD. People were either mellow or, or psychedelic. Woodstock would have probably been a whole lot different if cocaine and meth were the drugs of choice. There's a lot of rage associated with people who use both of those types of drugs. I've, I've seen cocaine and, and meth users. I've heard of many stories from police who have told me stories of the people they've apprehended on those particular controlled substances. If Woodstock had been a cocaine fest, it would not have been peaceful, and these injuries and deaths would not have been so few. But it was Ken Kesey who started becoming popular because he had the drugs 
And there was a group of people who he had as close confidants, and they became known as the Merry Pranksters. And we want to know where this whole magic bus, for those of us who didn't grow up in the 60s, I wasn't even around until 71, uh, for, those, for those who want to look back fondly on the magic bus, well, there was really one magic bus, and that was Ken Kesey's bus called Further. And in 1964, he took a road trip from San Francisco over to New York. And the Merry Pranksters were high on marijuana and LSD, and they drove across the country. And they were giving out their drugs, and they got a little bit of a following. And really, between the acid test in California and, and the uh, bus trip, I mean, hey, he was spreading the word, converting more people to the gloriousness of LSD. That was Ken Kesey. He was the one who was largely responsible for making, at least on the West Coast, making LSD and, and the drug use out there really in vogue. I mean, you know, they were using marijuana in the 40s and 50s, but anything harder than that really wasn't heard of at that time, uh, except maybe in small pockets. But, uh, you know, the driver of, of Further... Uh, happened to have actually been the uh, inspiration behind a character in uh, Jack Ker uh, Kerouac's book, uh, On the Road, from 1957. And it was On the Road, which inspired Kesey to take this trip to New York. And so we're going to show you some footage of um, the Merry Pranksters uh, on, on the road uh, through Texas. Almost everybody I knew had read On the Road, but I hadn't. And, and so I'd heard of him, I knew of him. He's the main character in On the Road. Yeah, if you read On the Road, he's Dean Moriarty. And you'd realize he was the driver. That was his thing. Besides talking, his other thing was driving. He liked to drive curvy, mountainous roads with cliffs on the edge at breakneck speed uh, in old cars with bald tires sliding around the turns while talking nonstop, looking over his shoulder to talk to the people in the back seat, driving with one hand or maybe just his knee, rolling a joint with his other hand while tuning the radio or feeling some girl's leg or something. Hundreds of thousands of miles of that kind of driving in his lifetime. A lot of people never got in a car with him a second time. Is, is our subconscious or soul mind our thought, our consciousness even, is in that same fourth dimension. We are actually fourth dimensional beings in a third dimensional body inhabiting a second dimensional world. I know when I say second dimensional, all these primary movements like elementals. What I'm thinking of. And, uh, We're driving down in Texas somewhere in a long straight thing, and the camera is way at the back of the bus and shooting up there. And Casty's driving, he's looking back there, and he's trying to get somebody to get him something to drink. And we're all talking, not paying any attention. The bus is moving down the road 60 miles an hour. He gets up and he just leaves the wheel. Leaves the wheel. The bus is moving through there, and the wind is blowing. And finally, the bus lurches and he falls back in the seat. And even when you look at it, it takes a while to realize, my God. The bus is moving and he is not behind the wheel. Hardly anybody noticed it. He was so animated. He's talking all the time. <laughs> Coming all like this and talking, he just completely commands the whole situation. You're moving the bus like this and talking to people back there. And pretty soon, we're all one organism. It's like we're a, a, a big pumpkin full of life and he is right there at the core of us. And we're rolling, rolling through the world. And so that was the experience of Neil Cassidy as the driver of Further on the Road. And, you know, these guys were pretty messed up on the roadway. But they were having fun, the Merry Pranksters. How many people did they kill? Surprisingly, they didn't kill anybody on that trip that I'm aware of. Um, but that was the way it was, right? Well, maybe in small little section of San Francisco. I don't think the rest of the country was quite that way, but hey, the rest of the country hadn't really experienced LSD yet. So now, 
by night, and that was 1964. And then the acid test actually, the, the yeah, the uh, electric Kool Aid acid test actually happened after the bus trip. So that was 1964. They made the trip to California, uh, from California to New York to go to the World's Fair, and uh, I think um, that was when. Kesey had a meeting with a publisher for one of his books, something like that. So there was some business to take care of in New York, and they decided to drive, and they did that. And so then, next thing you know, over the next couple of years, the situation in San Francisco's Haight-Asbury district gets a little bit more exciting, of course. Uh, the uh, band that became the Grateful Dead was Ken, uh, Ken Kesey's favorite band. They were local guys at the time. They weren't on the national scene yet. And so they were living in Haight-Ashbury. Jimi Hendrix was living in that area. Same thing with um, the Jefferson, Jeff uh, Jefferson Airplane and uh, Janis Joplin. They were all living in the same neighborhood of Haight-Ashbury. It was cheap district to live in. Of course, that's where they had a lot of the LSD, they had the music scene, they had the artist scene, and then by 1967 it became known as the Summer of Love. And we're going to take a quick look back, courtesy of KPIX, uh, they actually, uh, from San, uh, the San Francisco area, they did a, uh, a look back to 50 years of the Summer of Love. Now what does this have to do with healthcare as a right? We are actually getting to that. But this is an opportunity to look back 50 years to see how the summer of love made San Francisco what it is today. Early morning in Haight-Ashbury. Young professionals zip off to work with coffee in hand. Hard to imagine, 50 years ago, this was ground zero for a phenomenon known as the summer of love. The best guess is 100,000 people headed for the Haight that summer. They were mostly young people who streamed nonstop for three months in 1967 into a tiny neighborhood the size of only 0.3 square miles. As to why San Francisco? It had a freewheeling bohemian history. Why the hate? It was cheap. And why 1967? It was just this explosion of ideas and protests and music and uh, drug, sex, and rock and roll. To understand the summer of love, we stop by the California Historical Society. Here, counterculture historian Dennis McNally curated an ambitious exhibition. He says the era was not about hippies, long hair, flowers, or beads. You know, there was a very serious intellectual thing going on that challenged mainstream values. The exhibit touches upon iconic moments, from the beat poets to the experimental art scene. At San Francisco City Hall, students challenged authority, in this case, the House Un-American Activities Committee. They were met with the blast from a fire hose. Free speech and the freedom of thought became paramount. To challenge every assumption. Today at City Hall, a different kind of exhibit is on display. A treasure trove of photographs, all taken in 1967 by the late great Jim Marshall. Counterculture historian Nicholas Merriweather. The picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, nothing could be more true of the photographs of Jim Marshall. Marshall documented history in the making. His photographs show the events leading up to the summer of love. In January, the gathering of the tribes for a human being was held at Golden Gate Park. Timothy Leary set the tone when he told the crowd to turn on, tune in, and drop out. My advice is to sit down with your kids and ask them what they're learning, why they take it. The hate was already percolating with artists, college students, and musicians like the Grateful Dead. There were anti-war protests, Hell's Angels, and strange encounters. The old man in a three-piece suit and his hat shaking hands with the hippies. Amelia Davis operates the Jim Marshall Estate and Archive. Jim had a very curious eye, and he documented it. But the summer of love wasn't all fun and games for those who came. They thought it was going to be sunny and it was cold and they would dance and get cut feet and get pneumonia and have bad trips. Dr. David Smith is founder of the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic. With a host of volunteers, he opened its doors 50 years ago in June. Hundreds of people were already in line. The exam table was my kitchen table. All the medications were donated. But thanks to incessant media coverage and tourists, the summer of love ended in October with a mock funeral. 
called the death of the hippie. Participants carried a casket through the hate and set it ablaze in the panhandle. And soon, meth and heroin flowed in, targeting vulnerable kids on the street. For the next several years, the hate was kind of a, a very tough place to be. But the summer of love left a lot of good. This is where healthcare is a right, not a, not a privilege idea got started. If you do yoga, eat organic food, or are concerned about the environment, you're still moving in the currents that were kicked up in the 60s. Including the idea, hey, we can make a difference. There are things that we can do. When the summer of love hit, the community. So one thing. All right, I got like four different trains of thought going here. I'm going to slow it down here. So now we look back, and what happened? Oh, they had a great festival. Everybody is high on LSD and some marijuana and uh, alcohol, but it was all peaceful and it was loving and all that. But then, as soon as the summer of love kind of ended, that's when the hard drugs, the heroin, the cocaine came in, and then you had all the burnouts. Kind of get see where I'm coming here? Oh, LSD and marijuana might be one thing, but then you still have all of the other Schedule One drugs. What happens when you have a bunch of people who come over and invade an area who don't do anything to improve it and then need medical attention? Then you go to government, hat in hand, and say, hey, we have a problem here. Government, give me. And government of San Francisco says to Dr. David Smith, no, no, it's not our problem. We don't want him to stay. And so what happens? We are forced through the free market to innovate. That's the beauty of this, actually. See, where Dr. David Smith, uh, I believe that's his name, um, who created the Hyde Ashbury Free Clinic, and we're going to you know, hear from him in just a minute, he found a need. The, it, the, one of the secrets to success is to find a niche and fill it. By the way, that was Donald Trump who actually came up with uh, that concept and made that popular in the 80s. But you find a niche and you fill it. David Smith found a niche. He was a doctor and there were people in Haight-Ashbury who had come into the area who were you know, needed medical attention because of the cocaine and the heroin and they weren't from there and they didn't have jobs and they didn't have money and they still needed medical attention. So what do you do? If you are a doctor and you have patients to treat, you treat the patients. You build a clinic and from that clinic you need to be able to come up with ways to pay for it. And that's exactly what David Smith did. And he should be commended and applauded and I will commend him and applaud him for 52 years ago, finding a niche and filling it. That's kind of how the free market principles work. It, it, he was denied. Geez, kind of sounds familiar. Government doesn't want to pay for it, so government denies you. David Smith didn't want to be denied by the very government he asked for, so he fixed the problem. But yet now, 52 years later, he's still the one who comes out and says, hey, but you know, I said health care is a right. Healthcare is a right 52 years ago. Healthcare is a right. Government didn't fix the problem. You fixed the problem, David. The problem was fixed. You fixed it. Isn't that the model that you should be bringing up? Hey, I created a, a clinic to treat people, and they didn't have to pay for it. We raised the money. We love our clinic. We're doing a great job. We've helped people. We should use this as a model. That actually became a model. 400 clinics were established after that. That was a good model to choose from. David Smith gave us a good model. That's what he should be commended for. But now, oh, well, I said health care should be a right because you treated patients after you got denied by government. You should have figured out that, you know what, health care is not a right, so we got to take it upon ourselves to fix the problem. That's kind of what happened with Danny Thomas when he created St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. Now, hey, they have a great hospital. They've cured cancer in kids. They take on more patients. They've done a lot of research in the cancer department. They've raised a lot of money. They've created a great brand, and they've done a lot of stuff that has benefited society all around the world. David Smith's clinic hasn't quite matched up to that, and yet he's had 52 years, almost as long as St. Jude's. So let's take a look. Born on the Summer of Love, Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic.
when the summer of love hit. The community was total craziness. There was thousands of young people on the streets. I opened the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic in June of 1967. After interning at San Francisco General, I uh, studied clinical toxicology here at UCSF. As a result, I became the local drug expert and ran the alcohol and drug abuse screening unit. The streets were jammed, there was tour buses seeing the hippies, there was the rock music going on in the park, the Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Janis Joplin. All the kids were tripping out on drugs. The city actually tried to stop us through its regulations. And we went to them to try to have a regionalized health clinic and they said, no, you can't do it. So we found an old dentist's office at 558 Clayton Street. When they opened the doors, there was about 250 young people lined up down the street. And they came in with gonorrhea and cut feet and colds and pneumonia because they came from all over the country and they thought it was sunny in San Francisco in the summer and it wasn't and it was make love not war and uh, so there was all the sex and there was all the drugs and there was all the lifestyle and so we were jammed from day one running 24 hours a day. You had a stigmatized, discriminated against population because you didn't like how they looked, you didn't like what they did, you didn't like the fact that they were taking drugs, you didn't like the fact that they were protesting against society and therefore you were going to deny them health care, let them die, and make them go away. And that's when I first said health care is a right, not a privilege. May 1967, that became the founding slogan of the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic and then became the founding slogan of the National Free Clinic Movement because after we started our clinic, there was about 400 free clinics nationwide. A large number of the UCSF students, residents, nurses, some faculty from all disciplines, including the School of Pharmacy, uh, volunteered at our clinic and supported us. And the first major support I got was from Dr. Phil Lee as chancellor. He was probably the most important person to me at UCSF because we had this kind of underground activity that was getting a lot of publicity. The, uh, Dr. Lee, who was chancellor said, David, you're doing the right thing. I'm very much a product of the 60s, touched by the counterculture revolution, and I just believe that if you have enough forces aimed at the right thing, that eventually it'll arc towards justice. So if we have enough resources arched at the same thing, eventually we'll have justice. Um, before we have justice, can we have some personal responsibility? Can we start there? And this goes back to what I mentioned about Woodstock. 797 bad trips at Woodstock. 938 feet lacerations, but they didn't wear shoes. Take some personal responsibility. The failure to, for the people who went to Haight-Ashbury in 1967, the failure for them to take the responsibility for their own actions now means that you and you and you and you and over here, you, now, 52 years later, the Democrats say that you are responsible for their actions. I think that's personally an irresponsible thing. Really. That's what we've gotten out of the 60s? All this you know, music and free love and love beads and all of this. We now are responsible for paying for somebody else's medical care because they couldn't take responsibility for themselves. You think that 52 years later that Dr. David Smith and others who are leaders in the Democratic Party who were born out of the 1960s hippies movement would say, hey, you know what, you know, looking back, you know, maybe we were wrong, we should have advocated for responsibility. But no, they didn't do that. Now they want to burden you with somebody else's irresponsibility. That's where we got health care is a right. For Dallas Pearson Producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.